So uh, ISIS, unfortunately, or we often call it ISIL, is um, sitting on a tremendous amount of money. We need to be very candid about the, the threat we face as we try to cut off its access to revenues. But the primary two sources of funding have been oil sales and taxation, or you might call it extortion, of funds from the population in the territory that they control. And what sort of scale are we talking about? We're talking hundreds of millions a year, billions? I've, I actually have no idea at all. What so we're talking at least the hundreds of millions, and it could be in the many hundreds of millions. Um, but it's, of course, difficult. We don't have perfect intelligence or near-perfect intelligence when it comes to their revenue streams. As they uh, rolled through in terms of their initial military campaign and took over cities like Mosul, there were banks, standing banks there, that had cash in their vaults. And of course, of course ISIL then obtained control over those bank vaults. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that once that money is spent, it's not renewable. And the Iraqi government has moved to sever the access of all of those bank branches from Baghdad and therefore from the international financial system. Let's talk about the oil. Who on earth is buying oil from ISIL? So first, ISIL is a consumer itself of the oil that it's pulling out of the ground, and it also has a population that requires electricity in Iraq and in Syria. Um, interestingly, and maybe surprisingly for your viewers, the Assad regime in Syria is a primary customer of ISIL's oil, notwithstanding the fact that they're in open military conflict. Um, each has something the other one wants, in this case money on one side and oil on the other, and they have been doing quite a bit of oil trade. What about the other oil that is being sold though. How easy is it to stop that trade and say you're not going to buy oil from these guys? Well, our focus is actually one phase earlier, not on stopping necessarily the transactions and the sale of oil, but stopping ISIL from bringing that oil to market in the first place. And what you've seen over the last uh, series of weeks has been a really stepped up and very smartly crafted campaign by the coalition to conduct military strikes against ISIL's oil infrastructure and against the tankers, the oil tankers, that they rely on to bring that oil to market. You're saying that most of ISIL's money comes from internal sources, the oil and the, the banks and the taxation. There are donors though, aren't there? There is money being given to them from outside. A lot of attention has focused on Saudi Arabian donors. Are you satisfied that governments in the region are doing enough, and let's focus on Saudi, to stop their citizens donating to, to ISIL. So I'll tell you, we actually do not see major financial donations coming into ISIL. I think that the phenomenon we've witnessed in, in the cases of other terror groups, and I would think of Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, where you have deep pocket wealthy donors, sometimes in the Gulf, providing money, and sometimes you have charities that are either abused or that are intentionally set up to funnel funds to the terror group. We have not seen ISIL using those channels in any significant way. Now, in part, I think they would have a very hard time uh, raising funds in a place like Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabian government has come a tremendous distance in terms of setting up a meaningful anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing regime, and um, they deserve credit for that. But you also have to remember that the population in Saudi Arabia, by and large, sees ISIL as a threat. And that's true in many of the governments and among the populations in the region. Uh, ISIL is carrying out attacks that are killing Muslims. They're killing Shia Muslims, they're killing Sunni Muslims. And this is not a group that is uh, tremendously popular in many corners. How much do you think the economic attack on ISIL, how much can that achieve relative to, say, the military, the airstrikes? Uh, it's going to have to be both, there's no question. Remember what ISIL's needs are, what ISIL's expenditures are. They are trying to govern territory, a pretty large swath of territory, while fighting a multi-front war against, at this point, the US and our coalition, Russia, uh, and various other entities to the east, including the Iraqi army. That is not a cheap, uh, inexpensive endeavor. And so their financial needs are massive. To date, they've had access to major revenues that have allowed them to sustain this. But if we can start taking a real chunk out of ISIL's revenues, we're going to see the repercussions of that. One of the things that's caused just a, a bit of tension between the US and, and, and Europe have been absolutely enormous penalties, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars in the case of 
BNP, the, the, the French bank, over activities by those banks which were said to be breaking American law, primarily because the transaction probably between the European bank and Iran. Do you think the US has been extraterritorial, overzealous in the way it has punished European banks for some of these transgressions? This was not a, a stray transaction here and there that happened to find its way into a US bank without the knowledge, without the intent of the European banks. What we're talking about are uh, an intentional pattern and often a program that was designed to be able to access US banks to route money to and from parties like Iran, like Sudan, that were prohibited under US sanctions. And the, the intent was manifested in things like scrubbing payment transactions and even setting up computer programs to find the word Iran and delete it, replace it with something more innocuous. Adam Zubin, thanks very much. Thank you.